Our course, How I Treat Autoinflammatory Disorders, is comprised of eight to 10 sessions held weekly or biweekly, and the program will focus on various aspects of autoinflammation, pathogenesis, diagnosis, treatment, patient education, and network development. We intend to provide physicians, pediatricians, immunologists, and rheumatologists with an opportunity to access the latest updates on autoinflammatory disorders. We have gathered elite experts from around the globe, USA, Germany, Italy, Turkey, and Iran, to share their knowledge and clinical experience in each session. We hope these endeavors can lead to a better understanding of these newly introduced diseases which are probably not as rare as they appear. I need to take a moment here and thank Dr. Vahid Ziai, head of our scientific committee, professor of pediatric rheumatology at Children's Medical Center, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and the president of Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran for his full support of the course. We are also very grateful to Dr. Marjan Yagmai, head of Leading House for Iran-North America Academic Partnerships for a kind support. I would also like to express my gratitude towards Professor Sumeira Farman Raja, Professor of Rheumatology and convener of OPLAR Pediatric Rheumatology Special Interest Group. Thanks to her support and cooperation, our course is now endorsed by OPLAR. Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology or OPLAR was established in 1963 in Sydney. The world-known association of OPLAR strives to propagate and consolidate rheumatology endeavors in the Asia-Pacific region. OPLAR's mission and goals focus on providing a state-of-the-art care to patients with arthritis and other musculoskeletal diseases through the continuing professional development of members, increasing the awareness and understanding about rheumatic diseases, patient advocacy and empowerment, and fostering research in the field of rheumatic diseases. In order to receive a certificate for each session of our course, you need to register via Praise to Raise website. The link can be found here in the chat for room in my slide and in the session's poster. You can also register for the whole course and receive a certificate of attendance in an international autoinflammatory course approved and validated by OPLAR, Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran, Iranian Rheumatology Association, and Tehran University of Medical Sciences. For those who were not able to attend our previous sessions, there is a possibility to view the video of the session on the website, answer to the process, and be eligible to receive the course certificate. We decided to provide course certificate to all the ones who either participate in the session or watch the video and pass the process, as the goal of our course is to educate the participants. Today's session is entitled NLRP3 from Autoinflammation to Metaflammation. We are honored to have one of the most outstanding experts in the field from the, um, Germany, from Germany, Dr. Ike Latz. Dr. Ike Latz studied medicine in Göttingen and Berlin and worked as an intensive care physician at the Charity Hospital in Berlin. Starting in 2000, he received postdoctoral training at Boston University and UMass Medical School, joining the UMass faculty in 2006. In 2010, he returned to Germany and founded the Institute of Innate Immunity at the University of Bonn. Eike has co-founded IFM Therapeutics, Dioscuro Therapeutics, and a stealth biotech that translates discoveries into novel therapeutics. He has been a highly cited scientist in immunology yearly since 2014, and he has received prestigious awards such as the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize in 2018. The moderator of this session is Dr. Mayam Nurizadeh from Iran. Dr. Nurizadeh is an immunologist and an assistant professor in the immunology asthma and allergy research center, Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Tehran, Iran. Dr. Nurizadeh is also the supervisor of HLA Typing Lab and the director of Unrelated Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation Registry of IAARI, located in Children's Medical Center, Tehran, Iran. She is the head of IAARI's International Affairs and is the managing editor of Iranian Journal of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology as an Iranian ISI PubMed journal in the field of allergy and immunology. <laughs> 
Dr. Nurizadeh's research interests include newborn screening of primary immunodeficiency diseases and using TREC, KREC assay for early diagnosis of TMB cell defects, especially SCID, HLA typing, and tumor immunology. I want to ask you, our dear participants, to share your ideas and ask your questions during this session in the chat forum. It is better if you address your questions to Dr. Nurizadeh as a moderator. We will now begin today's session. Dr. Latz, we are all ears. And uh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Latz. Um, first, if we can hear um, Dr. Nurizadeh's introduction of the session and Dr. Latz's uh, introduction, I would be very grateful. Dr. Nurizadeh, can we hear your speech first? Thank you very much. Dr. Nurizadeh, I cannot hear your voice. I'm so sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Good yes. afternoon. Good afternoon, all mm -hmm. guests and participants, and uh, Dr. Aikik Lads. Thank you very much for introducing me. Uh, as uh, she said, I'm a faculty member of Immunology Asthma and Allergy Research Institute, and it was, and it is uh, uh, my pleasure. Uh, Dr. Nurizadeh, we cannot hear your voice. We have your video now. Please talk again. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be invited as a moderator to this webinar. Uh, as uh, the courses uh, named How I Treat, in, uh, it is, I think, it is a very interesting subject in the field of auto inflammatory. Uh, NLRP3 from autoinflammation to uh, metainflammation. Uh, we um, uh, uh, we have Dr. Latz uh, from Bonn, Germany. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Latz. Uh, as you know, NLRP3 uh, is a member of NLR family, a critical component of innate immunity. Uh, which can form inflammation, which is important for us uh, and responsible for responding to microbial and cell molecules. And this regulation results in auto-inflammatory and metabolic diseases. Uh, and meta-inflammation also is a very important uh, process as a low-grade subclinical system inflammation. So this um, speech would be very interesting and um, important for uh, knowing some procedures in autoinflammatory diseases. Thank you very much, Dr. Let's please uh, start your speech. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the nice introduction. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about uh, some of our favorite topics, um, which is inflammation, autoinflammation, metainflammation, as well as uh, the MRP3 inflammasome biology. So I'd like to start actually at the beginning when I started um, to transition from medicine to the field of innate immunity. This was kind of the picture we had at the time. So this was around 1996, 98. Um, I was working on LBP and how it can recognize um, LPS. But what was lacking is a pattern recognition sensor that senses LPS. And there was virtually nothing known and was a big black box. We knew about the IL-1 receptor. We knew about that IL-1 is produced in the proform and somehow is released from cells. But all these molecular mechanisms that we know now and we talk about now and that have probably also already clinical implications were completely unknown you know, around 20 years ago. Um, <clears throat> obviously, as you all know, the picture has changed a lot. Um, there's a much better molecular understanding of innate immunity today. Uh, there's multiple families of pattern recognition sensors that sense all kinds of different um, triggers. 
And I just briefly scan over those. So there's the CL, C type lectin receptor family, the CLRs. I'm not talking about this today at all. But suffice it to say that they probably recognize many more things than we know. But among those is fungal components, um, material from dying cells, altered sugars potentially on maybe tumor cells. Um, and there are a few members here you know, you know, listed, but there are many more members of this family. Um, there is the well-known Rick Eilag receptor family, RLRs, as well as CGAS. And both of these receptor pairs or receptor families uh, can recognize nucleic acids in the cytoplasm and drive um, mostly an interferon response, but they can also turn on NF-kappa-B at some point. Um, and they're very important in virus defenses. Um, the earliest uh, recognized mem members of the pattern recognition members were the TLRs, toll-like receptors, as mentioned already, is a TLR4 is the LPS sensor, but there's many more. Um, and they are linked to nf b activation, MAP kinase activation, but also some of the members can trigger interferon responses. Um, finally, the family I'm talking about today is the uh, NLR family. And um, some of them are pretty un unexplored, uh, but uh, I'm talking about NLRP3, which is probably the best studied, uh, yet still not fully understood NLR protein. So just to bring this up to this course, and all of these receptors, um, and all of these members of receptors, not that's not correct, and all of the families, there are members that can have gain of function mutations, and um, most of them can result in serious illnesses that are um, associated to intermittent fever, periodic fever. Uh, you can see polyarthritis, lung disease, brain disease, uh, skin disease, arthropathy, and, and so on, depending on the receptor that has a mutation or the uh, upstream um, molecules have, that have mutation. There are various clinical um, outcomes, but it is very exciting to see that with this knowledge of these type of receptors and their pathways that can trigger very severe inflammation, it opens the way for um, novel therapeutics and also for a better understanding of these complex uh, monogenetic diseases. So I think it's fair to say that there's a good need to better understand the proximal signals that drive chronic inflammation, because obviously these receptors have not evolved to make um, you know, monogenetic diseases, but they have evolved to sense material in the host that um, is dangerous, uh, that can appear in situations that are not supposed to be there. And uh, it is very important to understand, first of all, the triggers, the pathways that they engage, as well as the outcome of this type of inflammation. So as I'm talking about uh, NLP3, um, I have to talk about uh, a good friend, who is Hal Hoffman. Um, and Hal was really the physician scientist that recognized that in patients with this uh, very um, you know, auto-inflammatory syndrome, um, there, is, there are mutations within the NACH domain of this protein that he called at the time CIS1, uh, code-induced auto-inflammatory syndrome 1 disease, or 1 gene, which is now known as NLRP3. And this was back in 2001, where he found these mutations in patients that he treated. Uh, these were kids with um, classical CUPS disease. Uh, Jörg Chop, a fantastic scientist from um, Switzerland, picked up on this and found that family members, here we have NLP1, can form very large molecular platforms and that the platform can trigger the activation of inflammatory caspases, such as caspase one, and that this leads then to the processing of IL-1, uh, so that the pro-IL-1 is then turned into the active, shorter IL-1 that is then released. And uh, in this important paper, he showed that NLP1, when it comes together with PICAT, or also called ASC, the gene is called PICAT, but the protein is called ASC, is the adapter protein that then links caspase 1 to the inflammasome. And caspase 1 is then cleaved, as you can see here, as a shorter form. And that this is a specific event because another 
member uh, of another protein family, FAT, was not recruited into this uh, active complex, which he called inflammasome. So the name inflammasome and the very, very early work on this uh, molecular pathway was actually done by the CHOP lab. And um, this triggered a lot of work in many different labs around the world. He was also the first to show that the MLP3 inflammasome can sense crystals. So in here, he showed that gout-associated uric acid crystals can activate the MLP3 inflammasome. At the time, it was still called NALP3 inflammasome. But um, in the scenario where you have crystal deposition in various joints, you can have uptake of crystals by macrophages, maybe some oh, other cells. Oh, and this has, could you please um, stop your microphone? And, and this has the this has an effect um, on the cells and in this process of uptake of these crystals, somehow the MRP3 is uh, Okay, so I'm I'm muted again. Um, so that was the first description of a crystal triggering NLP3. And based on this initial description, many other papers came out, some of them from our group, um, showing that other types of crystals, such as aluminum salts, silica, asbestos, and many other triggers of inflammation can actually trigger the inflammasome via potentially the same mechanism. And this has um, relevance for lung disease uh, because some of these crystalline material can be taken up by breathing uh, small particles in the air. Um, the work by my former boss, Doug Goenberg, together with Michael Henniker and, and our lab uh, has shown that not just crystalline material, but also proteinaceous aggregates can ac activate the inflammasome. And this has relevance for Alzheimer's disease. There's a whole um, there's various papers that came out of our groups where we showed that in brain, brains of people with Alzheimer's disease, you have active pathway. So the pathway is engaged. We can see cleaved caspase one much more than in control patients. And in the mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, the MRP3 deficient mice were protected from learning deficits. So we think that the recognition of aggregates in the brain are caused, um, it can cause neuroinflammation and that this neuroinflammation is linked to the phenotype of Alzheimer's disease. Um, then a, a range of papers came out that showed that even um, fatty acids can induce the inflammasome and during obesity, you also have inflammasome activation and this instigates inflammation as well as insulin resistance. So this kind of uh, were the first papers showing that there is some sort of recognition of the state of um, in, in syndrome X, where you have a low grade inflammatory response that's also called metaflammation. And I'll come to this a little later. Um, our group has shown that another crystal that forms uh, when you have a hypercholesteremia, uh, namely the cholesterol crystal, can lead to inflammasome activation here, shown, for example, in human PBMCs, cholesterol crystals in, in, uh, in cells that are um, primed can trigger IL-1 release. And this is um, completely dependent. And in fact, this is not PBMCs, this is uh, um, macrophages from mice. So this is completely dependent on MRP3 and ASC. So we can also show in, v in, in vivo that there are crystals in the mouse model of atherosclerosis, and these crystals are in close proximity to macrophages and sometimes even inside macrophages. So we think that the cholesterol crystal deposition in this tissue may actually be an early cause of a trigger um, of inflammation. So, the question then comes is why is the NAD3 inflammasome linked to much, you know, very common diseases in Western societies? And um, do we, you know, have we evolved a sensor for, for this? And let's take a step back and see what happens during the last, you know, thousands of years. And uh, the question really was, was it always like, always like this, um, that we were chronically inflamed uh, during, uh, due to our lifestyle, or was it different before that? So if you, if you look back 
um, to what happened in the last 200 years, so 150 years. Um, this is quite educative here. So we have uh, the child mortality on the left side here and the life expectancy on the right side. And obviously they're linked to each other. And these graphs show that child mortality has drastically changed over the last 150, 200 years. And that um, even in Europe, we had about, you know, a third of the kids were dying early on. But due to scientific insights by physicians and scientists like Virchow, Koch, uh, and Paul Ehrlich, Van Bering, Kita Sato, um, and others, um, we understood now that there is, uh, it's necessary to have public health measures. Um, the first therapies such as antibiotics against uh, bacteria were invented and maybe very importantly, also immunizations were invented uh, due to the scientific insight that we had in the, the beginning of the uh, 20th century. But as, you show here, as shown here on the right side, um, this also led to much, much better life expectancies. And um, people are now getting that old that they can actually um, have age-related pathologies. Um, there are as, um, you know, many more lifestyle-related diseases that are coming up in later, uh, later in your life. And as we've just witnessed with the um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, during aging and maybe also during uh, lifestyle related, if you have lifestyle related disease, the, you have an increased susceptibility to infections. So if you compare the triggers for death, um, it was very different. Um, we had in the 1850s in Europe, in Western societies, we had primarily infections as the main causes for death. Uh, whereas nowadays, in the pre-COVID time, non-infectious diseases were the most important diseases. Um, if you look at what infection does to your immune system, you typically have some sort of a pathogen recognition or the injury that the pathogen does. It could also be a sterile in injury that leads to a local inflammation, which is um, tran transient and lasts maybe as long as the infection is around. And once the pathogen is eliminated or the injury is repaired, you have a resolution of the situation and there shouldn't be much more inflammatory responses. What you have gained after such an insight in events, you have an immune memory. And this is true for both the adaptive immune system as well as for the uh, innate immune system. I, I, I have some slides on that as well. If things go well, then you have a full resolution and everything is fine. Sometimes it causes uh, the inflammation or the injury can cause a systemic inflammatory response syndrome, it's called SIRS, or even a sepsis, and then the outcome can actually be the dismal as well. The immune response to Western lifestyle and these types of environmental triggers of inflammation is shown here on the right side. Um, it's not causing local inflammation. You typically don't see it, you don't feel it. There's no real fever. Um, but you can measure an inflammatory response in your blood. Um, and that's a pretty chronic subclinical inflammatory response that is also called metaflammation. And I think what we learn nowadays is that this chronic inflammatory response is um, important for the development for non-communicable diseases. Um, so it means that maybe in the future, we can you know, link the lifestyle factors environmental factors and even these genetic factors that are linked to chronic inflammation um, and link each and one of those to the development of diseases that are you know, shown here on the right side, which are found in so frequently in westernized societies. So I think it's very important to understand the causal relationship between the triggers of inflammation here on the left side and the resulting disease processes. Because if you understand this, you have the opportunity for intervention. First of all, you can um, learn about this, how are diseases triggered, and then you can base prevention programs on this. So you can prevent the disease to occur, or prevent the chronic inflammation to occur, but you could also engineer lifestyle medicines. Um, so try to have um, a ongoing chronic inflammation, try to reduce it or invent novel therapies um, that can address the very 
you know, molecular details why this chronic inflammation occurs in any, um, any number of these different risk factors. So, but what has happened in the last centuries, not, not just the last uh, 200 years. So for the longest time of human life, about 84,000 generations, um, people were living a lifestyle that is shown here in this picture. This is a contemporary nomadic, or at the time was nomadic hunter gatherers. And um, there are still contemporary nomadic hunter gatherer populations that live the lifestyle of our uh, collective past. And one example is the Hatsta population here in Tanzania. They lived the life that our ancestors had lived for 84,000 generations. So what is known is done by, you know, is known by the studies of these different populations. So here on the left side, you find all the different um, uh, nomadic hunters that are still living this lifestyle. And you can study them. So for example, the Hastas, they um, have a physical activity that is much, much higher than what we have in, in Europe and even in westernized populations like in South Africa and in the USA. And this is because people have to run around to find food, probably, um, uh, you know, to find water and, and things like this. Um, and they don't have a fridge where they can just open the door and grab the food because they have to catch it or have to uh, find it somewhere. What is interesting is that in these populations, there's still a very high child mortality, similar to what we had uh, in, you know, 200 years ago. And the mortality is mainly due to infections and trauma. If you survive your childhood, then the adult hunter-gatherer survivorship is similar to what we have industrialized nations, meaning that these people are getting as old as we are getting. Um, they are is a very interesting phenotype though, because these non-communicable civilization diseases that we have so prevalent in our societies are virtually absent in these hunter-gatherers. So it's very interesting to study this population. But still people die um, from infectious diseases, trauma, and very little non-communicable diseases. So if you look at this, for example, here's the CAC score, score, which is a measure of the amount of atherosclerosis that people had. Um, and in, in, in male, in 75-year-old male, you typically have atherosclerosis, at least in the Western societies, but also in, for example, in Asia. But the tsunami population, they actually develop almost no atherosclerosis. There's virtually no diabetes. And as you know, diabetes is a problem of a fairly recent past. So in the 1950s, the numbers were much, much lower than like this. And they are steadily increasing at the moment due to the obesity um, problem that we have. Same is true for hypertension. Um, it's rarely seen in these populations and as well as obesity because uh, there's much more energy being burned and probably they, they ought to take up less energy. But that said is that our lifestyle was much different and our exposure to um, common threats to probably the immune system has been, uh, has been, has changed a lot. So since we are genetically still adapted to this lifestyle, an exercise pattern of our Stone Age ancestors, um, we, it will take a long time to adapt to the novel, a modern lifestyle. And um, one could say that the modern lifestyle of humans is associated with the development of diseases. So what happened over the last 360 generations? As I said, this is 84,000 generations. And what happened thereafter is actually not that long, evolutionarily speaking. So obviously we had the transition of um, the nomadic uh, hunter-gatherer way of life to a more agrarian-based lifestyle. This is called the agricultural evolution. People became sessile, grew their own food um, and changed their lifestyle radically. Um, then for the last seven generations, there was uh, even large reduction in the amount of physical work because machines were invented. Um, and people did not work as hard anymore. There's an increase in air pollution, a broadenization. This is called the Industrial Revolution. In the last second generations or two generations, we have a digital age where there is uh, the prevalence of a sedentary lifestyle, 
mainly digital entertainment and there is a broad industrialized food production uh, where you don't even know what's in the food anymore. So the environment has changed um, in a very short amount of time in human development. And um, just wanted to, to reiterate that the most, most of the time was a different lifestyle. What we have now is a high prevalence of insufficient activity. So here's Germany is actually very bad. Um, and this is basically due to the sedentary lifestyle, digital entertainment, and many other factors. There's industrialized food production. We have an increase in daily calorie consumption. Uh, so there are, you know, uh, areas here in, in Central Europe and the United States where the food or the increase, uh, the, the daily calorie increase is twice or even triple the time than in other areas. So the projections for obesity uh, to 2025, which is not very far uh, ahead of us, are pretty dim. So we have uh, roughly half of the population in the US being obese, a third of the population in Germany. And this is a worldwide pandemic, I would say. And I, I show you some, some data on that as well. So why is that a problem? Because the earlier you are exposed to these immune activation causing uh, lifestyle factors, um, the more likely it is that you lose either a disease-free life or life in total. So for example, if you have hypertension at the age of 30, you lose about five years of disease-free uh, life. Um, obviously, if you develop this in 80, when you're 80, there's not much more life uh, that you live and there's less years of life lost due to disease-free uh, disease life loss. Same is true for obesity. There's a dose responsive uh, life loss. So for example, if you have obesity at the age of 15 or 30, then you lose almost a decade of life. Um, so if it develops later in the 50s or 60s, then uh, it's not as dramatic, but still there's a dose dependent effect on life loss due to obesity related diseases. So these data are important just because there's new data coming out that we having also an obesity crisis, not just in the adult population, but also in the younger population. So I'll show you some data from boys, so 10 year old boys. Um, and what this graph shows is obesity prevalence on the, um, this axis here, which has been across the board below 10% of the young boy population in 1975. Um, there is a little bit of a, um, a higher prevalence in Western societies. So this is the, the blue here. So the uh, blue color is Western countries. This is the USA. The, the size of the bubble is the, how many people, how many boys at 1975 were obese. And this is per capita GDP. So if I animate this data, you see that there has been changing uh, changes over the years. So the obesity is now much more prevalent and it's becoming really prevalent in other types of societies. So not just in the Western society, but also for example, in Asia. So this big bubble here is the a number of obese boys in the year of 2016 in China. And here we have United States, here's some of the European countries. I think this is India. So I think this is a problem that is just starting because these people, the boys in 2016, they now live with this type of lifestyle, uh, hopefully not too long, but they don't, maybe they change, but this, they have exposure in their organs to these risk factors for a long time. Okay, so what have you learned from this? Um, I think that metaflammation is an important topic and that at, this, at the core of metaflammation, there are these receptors of the innate immune system uh, that can se sense the triggers of these risk factors or that are given by these risk factors. And that long-term chronic activation of the immune system is a bad thing because it can cause these types of diseases. So if we look what we know right now about inflammatory responses in different tissues. This is summarized by the slides here. So we have this vicious cycle where a tissue injury or the appearance of danger signals, maybe some genetic factors, drive a immune activation of various cells. 
this then leads to the you know the production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, bioactive lipids. Maybe the cell death involved. Alarmants are being produced, and this then leads to further induction of um, inflammation in this in this area. The years of work in inflammation research and immunology research has luckily. Um, brought about a lot of new therapeutics, very potent therapeutics, not just non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, but now we have like a whole range of antibodies against most of these cytokines, um, some alarmants already, and there are the first small molecule inhibitors of pathways of cytokine uh, pathways, like JAK inhibitors, the JAK2 inhibitors that are being developed at the moment. So the armamentarium we have for treating inflammatory disease and chronic inflammatory disease is um, is brought and um, but there are some issues here so most of these drugs can cause immunosuppression the efficacy is often limited by their selective activity or on mostly redundant and late stage mechanisms and lastly all not all patients respond and some of them response uh, some of these responses actually are lost over the time so I think inappropriate activation of innate sensors, um, as it can trigger pathogenesis of chronic inflammatory disease, it's very important to understand it. So only if you understand the triggers, like the mechanisms, as well as the path, if, if you have pathway engagement biomarkers, you can develop novel therapies that are based on the core of the, uh, the disease um, that triggering. So um, now I'm going into detail into the NRP3 inflammasome pathway. I scratched on the surface a little bit, but I'm, let me just go a little bit deeper. So as you know, you need a priming step, at least in myeloid cells, uh, because NRP3 itself as a gene is at very lowly expressed in macrophages at least. So anything that triggers an pro-inflammatory transcriptional response, such as activation of the TOLAC receptor or of a cytokine, receptor or numerous other things can lead to the induction of obviously cytokines, chemokines, but with it also to NLP3 induction. So it's called the priming step. Then something happens that we still don't fully understand is called the licensing step because there are lots of post-translation modifications on NLP3 that is put on potentially during activation of the transcription. So while this protein is being produced, it's also being modified. Um, and then these modifications prevent its accidental activation. So there is a licensing step involved here that is not completely understood and may actually be quite complicated. There's also an activation step which then you know, um, converts the inactive form of NLP3 to the active form, which then can engage with ASC and trigger the downstream caspase one activation. I have to say that this pathway is also not fully understood. Um, there's a lot of groups in the world that will try to un understand how all these steps act together to activate this pathway. Just wanted to say that there is also elaborate splicing that occurs at the Lucinus repeat domain. We published on this a while ago. It's completely underexplored. So for example, this exon here is frequently spliced out in all the donors we've tested. Um, this is exon five, but also this one here, but also exon seven can be spliced out. So as you can see here, the domain organization um, or the exon organization of the, the Lucinus repeat domain, which is somehow perceived as being the sensor domain is very complex. So we think that in human cells, where splicing is, uh, is very important, um, we can get multiple forms of MLP3 that probably have different uh, ways to activate uh, an inflammasome. So there may be some more complicated issues here. And as you, if you overlay the post-translation modifications to these different forms of MLP3, you can see that there are forms that splice out ubiquitin binding sites or phosphorylation binding sites. So you can imagine that their, the half-life of the protein may be regulated by splicing and the post-translation modification and the activatability could also be um, regulated this way. Uh, we did a lot of screening using um, high throughput uh, you know, screening facility where we take a look at compounds, how these interfere with the inflammasome activation that you can see here. 
And you find then by these compounds, new pathways that are involved in activation of the plumosome. And some of the work is shown here. Some of it's published, but most of this stuff is unpublished, but you can kind of recapitulate what the, uh, what the field has, has done in this area. So once this inflammasome is formed, then it's kind of the point of no return, even though they are regulatory mechanism that can allow some sort of a regulation of, of, of this form here as well. But it's perceived that this molecule actually reorganizes in a way that it then can trigger ASC um, spec formation. So ASC, remember, is the adapter protein that is triggering caspase one activation. And it's an interesting molecule because it's a, a molecule that forms a large protein helix, which I'll show you in the next uh, picture here. You can image this, this protein helix when it forms. Um, and this helix is perceived as a platform that then recruits the, via the card domain, uh, the caspase one and activates caspase one. It can potentially also activate caspase eight, uh, but it's not so well studied. In any case, once these inflammasome form and they make these ASC helical fibrils, they can actually assembly via card card domain interaction into these large structures. And these large structures are the size of about, you know, a microbe, maybe a, a micron or so, uh, several hundred nanometers in size. And you can visualize them quite easily in cells. And they actually can also be released from cells when they're activated and have an extracellular life. I'm not talking about this today. So the downstream events are once the aspect is formed, as I mentioned already several times, caspase one is activated by autoprolytic uh, cleavage of caspase one. That then leads to the activation of ProIL-1, ProIL-18, maybe other things, as well as Gastermin D, a molecule that then forms a pore through which IL-1 and maybe also IL-18 can escape from the activated cells. In some scenarios, you also get the induction of cell death called pyroptosis, because this is a cell death that is inflammatory due to IL-1 and IL-18. Next to the activation of these specific cytokines, we can also see, as I mentioned, the extracellular aspects, as well as released vesicles um, and other factors such as HMGB1. And all these factors in aggregate can then um, lead to responses in the surrounding tissues. So depending on where the inflammasome is activated, you can get response of the um, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, epithelial cells, uh, neurons, um, and, and so on. Um, so as I mentioned, the extracellular vesics, vesicles can be uh, released. We have profiled um, what is in there. And you can see here, there's real signatures that tell you that the inflammasome has activated or has been activated by just measuring the amount of transcripts and the kind of transcripts that you find in those vesicles. So maybe this could be developed as a biomarker for inflammasome activation if you could uh, recapitulate, uh, recapitulate these type of data in patients, for example, auto-inflammatory patients, that would be quite an interesting thing. Um, also, you can then take these vesicles and add them to receiving tissues and see how the tissues respond then to the extracellular vesicles that are listed by inflammasome activation. So you can gather information around how is the tissue responding to inflammasome activation and not only to IL-1, but maybe also to the transcripts and to the contents of these types of vesicles. Okay, so that's kind of a run over over the inflammasome activation pathway. Um, now let's see how we can drug this pathway. So there has been a compound called uh, CRIT3. This was developed by Pfizer a long time ago, actually 15, more than 15 years ago. And it's called cytokine release inhibitory drug and CRIT. And these molecules have the ability to block IL-1 secretion, but not, uh, and let's say IL-1 secretion, but not TNF secretion. So they somehow were specific for that pathway. Now we know, and I'll show you the latest data that we have just published yesterday, uh, we have the EM structure of the molecule CRIT3, which is the inhibitor of NLP3, and uh, the form that we have. And just want to say that the model we had before the EM structure was this, and it was a little bit wrong, I'll show you why. But 
we, we have in this pocket here, we have the molecule and it assembles inside the Nacht domain, which typically has to unfold for this molecule to have a, um, an open structure that then can form the active version of it. Um, just one, one step back before, before I show you the structural information um, and a little bit of a recap. So again, metaflammation can be triggered by inorganic crystals, by the phase transition of molecules that fall out of solution, basically, the soluble to crystalline, such as uric acid, cholesterol. It can happen when proteins or peptides aggregate and make large complexes, and this can be in the brain, this can also be elsewhere. Um, there's even uh, new data on a crystal that is made of galactin 10. So it's a protein released from eosinophils. These are called chacolidin crystals in medical language. And you find them in um, patients with eosinophilic inflammation, such as asthma, for example. And these crystals can also activate the inflammation. Um, you can induce actually cholesterol crystals by giving mice a high cholesterol diet, which they normally don't eat. So over four weeks, eight weeks, 10 weeks, you see an increase in crystal deposition in the liver, for example. But you can also find this in the skin, in the brain, in, in all kinds of areas. Um, in humans, you find in older people, 70 year old male here, you find crystals sticking through the intima into the lumen of the artery. And you can also scan and find macrophages having contacted these crystals at least. In the mouse aorta, our work has shown that you can induce crystallization of cholesterol in, uh, in the aorta. So now I, I bring you to an, a, um, another topic, which is how a dietary trigger um, of inflammation is somehow linked to atherosclerosis development. And this brings about the topic of trained immunity. I think this is an important topic. Um, that's why I highlight this here. And this is one of the risk factors that I mentioned in the earlier slides on the left side. So we're trying to decipher what are these different individual risk factors, how they can induce inflammation. Is it maybe long lasting inflammation, i.e. trained immunity, and how this leads to atherosclerosis development. Um, and just to show you that there are other species where you have trained immunity, meaning a form of innate immune memory, which is not dependent on T cells or B cells. Um, so there's this system that's called systemic acquired resistance. So these are inducible defenses in plants, and they are bas basically um, based on transcriptional re reprogramming of defense ready genes in the plant cells once they see a trigger. So this, this is a, some sort of a memory response because the cells, once they have the first trigger, respond in a different way when you add a second trigger. In other species, it's called primed immunity. So for example, it has been shown that plant, uh, sorry, that earthworms have, can have a transplant rejection um, phenotype, yet they don't have T cells and B cells. So this has to be somehow the innate immune system that is trained or primed in this case and that can lead to transplant rejection. Bumblebees have been studied a lot with the reinfection studies. So also there you can identify a trained immunity of the innate immune system. Um, same is true in Drosophila and even the commercial shrimp you may eat tonight. Uh, they were vaccinated uh, even though they don't have a T cell B cell response, meaning they were stimulated with a pathogen that doesn't kill them to prepare them for the, the life in the aquatic uh, environment they are put for, for growing. So it, it makes sense to prime the immunity in shrimp so that they um, survive a more hostile environment. And then lastly, CRISPR cas is probably also some sort of, sort of a trained immunity. So this concept has been um, shown quite, uh, you know, quite well with, with different pathogens. So Canada, BCG, CMV infection uh, were caused, you know, were used as a first stimulus. And then the cells were rested or the mice were rested for a certain amount of time and then re-stimulated with like either the same stimulus or with a different stimulus, mostly with like viruses and bacteria. And during, you know, many, many groups has shown that there is this type of 
variation of the immune response to the um, in response to the first stimulus. So the second stimulus always gives rise to either a prolonged response, diminished response, or even a higher response. So and this is independent of T cells and B cells, and it's probably a reorganization of the chromatin in the cells after the first stimulation that gives rise to a second, you know, alpha response. Um, so we set out to un understand this also when we use a Western diet, so primarily a sterile trigger of inflammation, and see whether this is actually also providing some sort of a training of the innate immune system. And the model system here is we use then after Western diet feeding, we gave mice one shot of LPS and then analyzed whether this, the, the innate immune system was uh, responding differently when they were first trained with the Western diet. And this has some uh, um, relevance for chronic uh, inflammatory or um, autoimmune diseases such as SLE, RA, OMS, and et cetera. Okay, so do these studies, we've done a systems approach of uh, innate immune memory and uh, gave a Western type diet to mice, measured all kinds of things in the, in, in the gut, but then also took out major um, populations of myeloid cells to understand the transcriptional responses and epigenetic uh, responses. And the setup is quite simple. So we put mice on show diet as control or we put mice on a Western diet for four weeks, or we put mice on a Western diet followed by a show diet. So this is like a diet induction, Western diet induction, and then resting period of four weeks to see whether there's a training effect and whether the inflammatory response is more long lasting. So if you do this type of uh, procedure on mice, you find that on a Western diet, they have very high cholesterol levels which is then giving rise to atherosclerosis if you would wait longer, but after four weeks, there's not yet uh, full atherosclerosis in these mice, but they are inflamed. Um, and then if you take away the diet, the Western diet and put them back on show diet, the inflammation goes away. And it's a good model for looking at what can a non-sterile, like a sterile trigger, how can a sterile trigger induce um, trained immunity? So let's look at the systemic host response. As I mentioned, if you put a Western a mouse on a Western diet, you will find all kinds of cytokines and chemokines in, uh, in the blood, meaning that the mice, while they have this hypercholesterolemia, they also have inflammation. I think this we can call probably metaflammation in the mouse. Interestingly, if you take them away from the Western diet and feed them the regular grain-based chow diet, serum cholesterol goes down, but also the inflammatory response is no longer seen with a few exceptions. Um, so that was ideal because we wanted to see whether this training event where we give a Western diet for a period of time, how long lasting this is. So what we did is then we just gave mice a Western diet and then looked in the spleen macrophages and bone marrow cells, how do they respond to innate immune stimuli? So this is a simple graph here, just to illustrate this. Um, so for example, if you put mice, if you, if you take bone marrow cells from a chow diet fed mice, you get an LPS response, an IL-1 response towards LPS that looks like this. If you do this while they are inflamed, four weeks of Western diet, the LPS response is much broader or higher. Here, for example, IL-6, probably fivefold, here's maybe twofold. But the most interesting part is then the blue color here, because these are mice which no longer have systemic inflammation. I just showed you all the inflammatory cytokines in the serum are gone, but the cells respond in a more dramatic fashion, higher fashion towards LPS, even four weeks after having seen a diet. So that means there's a re reprogramming going on and those cells has, have been reprogramming and reprogrammed by the Western type of diet. And this is not only seen um, for IL-1, IL-6, this is across the board. So these are block two concentrations um, of all these cytokines and chemokines in bone marrow cells and splenic macrophages towards TLA2 responses. So that what you can see here, there's a very complicated picture, but it basically means once the mice have seen a Western diet, the responses of these myeloid cells towards TLA2, towards TLA4, towards TLA7, towards TLA9 are different. It's every TLR has a different uh, type of signaling, 
and the response can be higher or lower, but it's all kind of different once the mice have seen a Western type of diet. And it doesn't normalize if you put them back. So for, for example, here, if the mice were rested for four weeks after the Western diet, then they have much, much higher response to TL9 in terms of TNF and whatever it's IL12 and so on. So across the broad, uh, across the board, all these cytokines and chemokines respond in a more dramatic fashion towards TL9 when they have seen a diet in eight weeks ago. So it looks like that this Western type dieting is memorized by innate immune cells. And um, we then wondered whether that also alters the cell composition of the blood. And this was actually the case. So as you can see here, more mice on the Western diet have higher monocytes, higher granulocytes. So we call this monocytosis and granulocytosis, I guess. Um, and the lymphocytes tend to go lower. So um, that means that potentially the novel um, production of these cells is increased. And we can also find inflammatory monocytes and granulocytes in organs, in all organs actually, but here we find it in the spleen. So just adding a Western diet gives rise to more cytokines, more chemokines, more cells, and the cells emigrate into tissues and they're reprogrammed. So then we looked at what happens in the bone marrow. So what we can see here is that there is selective increase in GMPs. These are the granulocyte monocyte precursors and the CMPs go down, which are the T cells precursors. Um, and in medical lingua, lingua, you would call this emergency hematopoiesis because there's a trigger that actually triggers the production of more GMPs and then it leads to um, you know, higher amounts of cells, activated cells and so on. So I think the Western diet is somehow misinterpreted by the immune system as an infection because that's the same response you would see towards an infectious particle. So this functional reprogramming, we were wondering, does this normalize very quickly or is it also something that's lasting longer? So we did this experiment where we gave mice, again, these three different diets, Joe diet only, Joe diet, Western diet. So this is basically only after four weeks Western diet or the Western diet followed by the Joe diet. And then instead of just profiling the cells for the responses, we profile their in vivo response by just injecting LPS. And six hours later, we just looked at the cells and the precursor cells. And what you find in those cells is that they respond to LPS, even under Joe diet conditions, obviously. Under Western diet, there's much, much more responses. So many more genes are turned on when you have the mice on a Western diet. And quite interestingly, even after you know, changing the diet back to Joe diet, there are very complex changes in these cells. So all this cluster here that's still triggered in, uh, by LPS in the Western diet condition is gone, but yet we have this cluster here coming up. So it's a very complex reprogram of cells. We cannot say it's only that gene or that gene many genes are affected by this innate immune reprogramming. Now, since this was all very complicated and we wanted to find out what is the upstream trigger that senses somehow anything in the Western diet and that gives rise to this reprogramming. And we were kind of at the end with our omics um, approaches and then went back to the human model system. So in humans, it's known that during atherosclerosis, there are the accumulation of macrophages there being recruited to the plug and they turn on um, and take up OxLDL, which is an inflammatory LDL particle and that stimulates them and then they store this. So we said, why don't we just train macrophages, human macrophages with OxLDL and then see whether after a resting period, they actually respond differently to the LPS. So this has been done together with our great uh, collaborator Mia Netea and Yang Li. So what we did is we trained um, macrophages from actually were, were monocytes, monocytes macrophages from 120 normal human volunteers with ox LDL for a day. Then we let the cells sit for six days and um, the second stimulus was then LPS. So we then wanted to see, okay, what are the genes that affect this training? So you can call this also training QTL right, innate immune training QTL studies, which genes affect the 
hyper responsiveness that you see by training the cells with oxalic layer towards LPS. Very complicated, but actually it, it boiled down to the NLT3 inflammasome. So the genes that were mostly um, responsible for a heightened TNF response was ASK. And ASK, as you know now, is the adapter molecule of NLP3 and all the other NLRs as well. So since we have made the NLP3 knockout in the atherosclerosis prone background, we then looked whether those smells maybe do not respond anymore to the Western diet after four weeks. And this is the data here. So you see that they don't sense it anymore. So there's almost no increase in cytokinemia after you add a Western type of diet. And this was also true for many of the chemokines. So then we looked in the blood where we see this myeloid increase, also that was gone. Um, so we think that the bone marrow stem cells are not activated anymore and don't give rise to more myeloid cells and more reprogrammed cells. So we looked into this and what you find here, the LDL not three knockouts, they don't respond to the diet. They don't increase in numbers. They don't activate activation factors like CD86 staining you can do after diet on these GMPs, granulocyte monocyte precursors, you see normally an activated state, not in the NAT3 knockouts, and they don't proliferate. So here, this is proliferation after Western diet feeding of GMPs, um, which is completely absent. And even the activation is completely absent. So if you, if you look at the signature that we can determine, this is the Western diet induced signature in those mice, it's completely gone. Uh, not completely, but most of the genes that are used or reduced by the diet is gone. So um, what we can conclude from these studies is that the diet induces a systemic host response. This systemic host response can, be, can lead to chronic inflammation. This chronic inflammation leads to increased responses towards stress or maybe inflammatory conditions. And you can, you can think of everything here that is a trigger for inflammation. So I think that, that these are linked somehow. Maybe they are linked via the activation of the bone marrow stem cells. And this can give you rise to a much higher response to infection, for example, or a dysfunctional response to infection. So this could be why people with like um, risk factors for, um, you know, that you have during obesity, for example, have a dismal response to an infectious agent. Okay, so I'm almost at the end of my time here. And um, what I will do is I will skip a few slides and go to uh, very recent data, which came out yesterday. So here. So I told you about the smaller molecule compound that stabilizes an inactive configuration. Um, so we looked into this by looking at the structure of the full length protein. Most of these crystal structures were done with like shorter proteins that behaved uh, in a better way. But we managed um, together with um, the Institute of Structural Biology at the University of Bonn. Um, this is Matthias Geier. For some reason, his name is gone. So Matthias Geier. And the student was Inga Hochheiser. So we managed to identify that NLP3 in the absence um, of activation and the presence of the crit molecule actually does not form a monomer, but forms a decamer. And this decamer has this structure, a very organized structure, it almost looks like a football, maybe a soccer ball, I should say. Uh, it has this diameter, 20 nanometers times 16.5 nanometers. So this is the structure of the inactive NLP3. And what you see is that it's a very organized molecular um, structure which has to be disintegrated before it can actually assemble into something that's activating. Um, because this structure here is uh, um, inside the structure, you have the, uh, sorry, the PYD domains and the PYD domains are the ones that interact with ASC. So they're shielded almost in a cage. Um, and this cage uh, doesn't allow it, the, the business end to, to do its business, meaning binding to ASC. There's more, many more details um, of the structure, and I urge you to take a look at the paper. It just came out yesterday. It's an acceler accelerated article preview at Nature. And you can see, for example, how 
this molecule is or how the multimer is actually held together. So the loose and rigid peats, they interdigitate and hold each other like this. Um, and that is because there's a loop that is charged and um, this interaction is probably also important for the activation mechanism. But here we have a view on the crit molecule. So what you see here are the subdomains of the Nacht domain and the Nacht domains needs to elongate as I mentioned to activate the protein. And interestingly, this molecule, small molecule inhibitor makes interactions with all these subdomains. So it binds the residues of all the subdomains shown here. And it's almost like a molecular glue, a glue in a domain that's neatly folded together um, and would not allow it to open up to form the activated structure, which looks like this, where Nachtomain is like elongated and not, you know, came together. Okay, and then lastly, um, this also allows us now to better understand mutations that lead to outer inflammation. So as you see here, these are all the mutations, no, no, not all of them, but some of the uh, mutations that lead to CUPS or the various uh, subforms of CUPS like uh, Zinka or MW as a Michael Wells syndrome or FCUS. And you can find that these mutations are very close to the region where the NLP3 NACH domain is held together. So these are the areas that are, that are important for stabilizing the inactive conformation. If you have changes, sometimes drastic changes from E to K, so um, that means that this area is probably not held together or held together as well as without this um, pathogenic mutation. Okay, so with that, I'd like to thank um, people. Uh, first of all, the uh, funding agencies that, that fund our research, but also you know the people that are at the bench and are really doing the work. And uh, it's not me anymore, unfortunately, but it's all these talented postdocs and students that really make the difference and are preparing these pathways for the next discoveries in the um, for drugs. So with that, I'd like to uh, stop my share here and thank you for listening. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Les, for your very nice, interesting uh, speech. That was so interesting for me. And, and I found that our uh, diet is so important for us in all aspects, especially uh, training our innate immunity as a found training immunity can uh, be done by our diet and it can be mimic uh, the infection the infectious and uh, can trigger the inflammation and can result to um, some diseases like cardiovascular disease or maybe cancer and so on thank you very much um, if you have some question uh, before um, uh, before asking questions uh, from our participants, I, uh, I would like uh, to thank you all our guests and participants for uh, attending the, this uh, webinar. And I should ask you a question about the uh, probably, probable uh, relationship between NLRP and uh, cellular redox oxidation uh, in the cells. Is that any relationship between them? Um. Well, I think there is. Um, we don't understand it. That's the problem. So the NLP3 NACH domain and the Lucent Richard P domain has a lot of cysteines, for example. So it could be that there's some oxidation event on the protein itself. And as you know, it's a little bit controversial, but uh, many people have used antioxidants as inhibitor of, of the NLP3 inflammasome. Um, but we don't fully understand whether they act directly on the NLP3 protein or on some mechanism that is upstream of NLP3. So, so far, uh, we only know there's a big connection between the oxidative state of the inflammasome, but how on a molecular level it affects NLP3 activation is unfortunately not yet fully understood. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, another question is uh, the, prob the possible relationship between uh, NLRP3 inflammasome activation and uh, inflammaging. As you know, inflammaging is uh, very um, important and also recent uh, publi publications are related to this topic. Uh, can you give me some information about that? Thank you. 
Yeah. So, I mean, there are many studies actually, and some, some of the really good studies were from um, people at, uh, at Yale, where um, it was shown that the mice, NLP3 knockout mice, are pretty much protected from many forms of inflammation. So the older mice had um, less thymic involution, they had a broader, um, you know, broader cell population in terms of the variability of cells, they had less osteo, uh, uh, osteoclast problems. So there's a real phenotype in those uh, mice. I mean, how this, what is sensed there in during aging, I think is not understood unfortunately. Otherwise, it would be uh, nice to treat those pathways. Um, but it's very clear that there's a connection of the NRP3 inflammasome during aging and many of the aspects of uh, inflammation. So I think this low grade inflammation that you have during aging process is at least triggered in part by NRP3 activation. And Vishwa Deep Dixit has done very nice work on this, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much for your explanation. I want to back to the chat box and some questions we have there. And one question is about the uh, NLPR1. Is there any association between NLRP1 inflammation pathy and all? Uh, have you ever had, this, had such patient? Yeah, so NLP1, there are gain-of-function mutations, um, and they, they cause a syndrome that then lead more or less to skin, uh, skin problems and not this type of um, inflammasomeropathies that you see with NLP3 gain-of-function. So it's a, it's a very different feature. Um, so you, you have uh, skin lesions, uh, skin ulcerations, skin uh, tumors even, if you have a gain-of-function mutation of NLP1. Um, it's not fully understood um, because NLP1 is also expressed in the myeloid compartment, not to the same level and not in all the same, uh, same cells. Um, and the issue here is that the study of NLP1 is not so easy in mice because there's different alleles, uh, NLP1 A, B, and C, which have different responses to um, different triggers even. And so I think there is not really a good concordance between a human species and the mouse species, which really blocks this field a little bit. But I think still, NLP1 is extremely important for maybe pathogen defense. Um, it may be important for uh, the inflammation in the skin potentially uh, and other things, but it's understudied. Thank you very much. Another question is about the uh, the diet, can it possibly be stated that other than atherosclerosis, other autoinflammatory disorders can have underlying dietary causes, and that is the reason for their increased incidence? Um, I would say uh, differently. I would say that the inflammation that can be caused by dietary intervention or by, by Western-type diet can contribute to the diseases that are caused by maybe also other triggers. So it's more like a, a factor that contributes than being the only factor. Um, we're trying hard to identify what is it in the diet that triggers this inflammasome activation because that, that's probably very important to understand. We have the first uh, hits on that. Maybe I can show that next time because it's very preliminary, but there are real factors that are appearing in Western diet fed mice at least. And some of these factors are also related to obesity and, um, and they are inflammatory factors. So there's real pathways linked to the diet and that could potentially be blocked. Um, but to your question again, I think it's very well known that people with like, I don't know, MS or rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they, they know what they shouldn't eat because they can exacerbate their own disease by having the wrong diet or maybe excessive um, uh, alcohol consumption and, and things like this. So people are watching the diet mostly because they learn to live with this disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Lats. Um, Dr. Salizadeh, please ask your question. Please unmute your microphone. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Do you have my voice? Yes, we have. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Watts. Uh, wonderful presentation uh, and wonderful topic uh, slides. You have a very nice bike and uh, <laughs> quaint accent, especially when you say Nacht. That was too Dutch and German accent. Thank you very much. I have a question, Dr. Lutz. Uh, we are talking about an LP3 um, pathway in it in innate immunity in uh, adult and uh, older population. We have these mutations in autoinflammatory disorder in kids and uh, as a hereditary autoinflammatory disorder. What do you think about the uh, uh, background of these mutations in human species. What is the cause of this mutation? We have mm, uh, many disorders in autoinflammatory disorder with different mm, mutations in autoinflammatory. What is the background of these mutations? What do you think? What is your idea? And uh, after this, I have the second question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the questions. I um, have to ask, so you mean why we acquire those mutations or um, why the phenotype in different mutations may be different? Why do we have these mutations? What is the cause of these mutations? In well, they're inborn errors, right? So typically um, those mutations are inherited, uh, at least the ones that cause these um, um, this type of diseases, they are inherited. So they come from the parents and they got them from the environment, I guess. <laughs> no? Or is that not the question you asked? Yeah. And um, uh, my understanding is uh, your idea is about the environmental factors mm -hmm. as a main role in these uh, mutations. Yeah. No, no, that's not the, the, I think the environments can trigger regular inflammasome activation um, and that we're living in an environment where this occurs more than it used to be in our ancestors. I think we are having some sort of a level of inflammation or let's say the triggers of the inflammasome, we have it, we reach it in modern societies so that there's low grade activation of inflammasome, but this can be complete in the absence of um, mutations. And I mean, people that have mutations have much, much higher responses. They have like skin disease, neurological diseases and uh, arthropathy. So I think that is a different amount of activation that you see in the inherited forms of um, CUPS, for example, which is point mutations within the gene NLP3, would give rise to um, this chronic, very strong inflammatory syndromes that Need to be treated really. So it's a different different thing. I mean, obviously the uh, the triggers of the um, cups is is genetic, uh, yeah. But also these people probably are in, in those people. There there are these flares. You normally have a flare after they are exposed to cold, for example, when you have certain mutations, or they have a flare when they have the, the wrong diet can happen. Um, and then they need to take an akinra or kinakinumab to really bring it down again. But um, I think we are, we're looking at two things here. One is genetic and the other one is environmental. Thank you Thank very you much. Very My much. second question, yeah. May I have a question? My sure. second question, Dr. Oletz, is, um, different triggers in uh, NLP3 um, signaling, canonical and non-canonical. What is the difference between canonical and non-canonical? Um, well, the non, so the canonical triggering of inflammasome is kind of if you prime the cells with LPS, which is not alone activating the inflammasome in macrophage at least, um, and then activate them with crystals or you know 
this poor forming toxins, nigericin, and these kind of triggers, which then leads to rapid activation of the inflammasome, aspect formation, and the induction of pyroptosis, so real cell death. So this is how we started to study the inflammasome. There's also a non-canonical inflammasome activation, or sometimes also called alternative inflammasome activation, where you can, uh, for example, in monocytes, adjust LPS and wait much longer and give higher amounts of LPS, and you, there's no need for a second trigger. So also that pathway is not fully understood. There's some role of caspase 8, for example, um, but sometimes the inflammasome activation does not need two signals, and that's, that's also called um, alternative or non-canonical activation. Thank you very much. May I have one more question, Dr. Maya? Yes. Yes, yes please. Uh, yes. Doctor, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lutz, uh, after your uh, presentation, uh, my understanding is the, the inflammatory pathway has a main role in some chronic disease in adult, like hypertension, uh, diabetic, and uh, Alzheimer. With this background, what is your recommendation about um, usage of anti-inflammatory drugs in combination with specific drugs, a specific therapy with for um, hypertension, for obesity, for Alzheimer. Do you recommend anti-inflammatory drugs in these disorders and long life therapy? Thank you, it was my last question. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think you cannot, I mean, this, these are very long processes where you have a chronic smoldering inflammation that is subclinical, which is triggered by these lifestyle risk factors. And since we do not fully understand all the triggers, all the pathways, I think it would not make sense to take the drugs that affect downstream processes, such as, you know, you could take TNF or IL-1 and, and all these kind of uh, very potent uh, drugs, but they also may pose a not necessary risk for serious infections. So I think it's too early to say, okay, we need to treat everyone that has metaflammation with kenekinumab or an anti-TNF, which is probably not the right approach because we have to really decipher the specific risk factor triggers or the triggers and the risk factors that trigger the different pathways. And once we have then this type of precision immunology where we understand this and we may have already precision drugs then that target, for example, the inflammasome or ASC or, you know, TLR4, then um, one could surgically remove or prevent the activation of these different pathways. But for that, you need to understand, first of all, the um, pathogenesis of these diseases better because they're mostly multifactorial. And you need to identify which pathway is actually turned on in a given patient. And I give you an example. So, for example, in, in rheumatoid arthritis, some people benefit a lot uh, from a TNF therapy, but others don't because we still don't really understand the upstream triggers and which cells are involved. Um, so, I think it would not be good to conclude here that, oh, everyone that has metaflammation needs to be on drugs because that's too early. I think one can conclude that a uh, you know, lifestyle modification um, would be much more efficient because we understand that the lifestyle is linked to disease development and we can actually prevent it. In fact, about 70% of diseases can be prevented by, uh, by lifestyle changes. Um, so that is probably the better message now. And the other message would be that within a few years, maybe the next 10, 20 years or so, we may have the armamentarium as physicians to treat very specific pathways in a more selective fashion than we have now. And then maybe their diagnostics is also good enough to understand this disease pathogenesis so, so well that we can actually utilize those anti-inflammatory anti therapies. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sadezadeh as a member of the scientific committee of this course and his valuable questions.
Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, can the participants ask uh, some questions about the clinical aspects of your lecture and also the treatment protocols or maybe procedures? Sure. I'm not, uh, I'm not treating these patients. I'm doing basic yeah. research. Right? Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Uh, Mobahedi, please ask your question. Can you have you, an access? You. Okay. Good Thank afternoon. You, You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. And thank you, Dr. Lads, for your valuable lecture. Uh, my question is about differences uh, in terms of clinical manifestations, uh, response to treatment, and also complications such as amyloidosis in those who have somatic mutations and on those who have germline mutations. Are there any differences uh, between these um, two uh, kinds of mutation? Um, I don't think that has been studied enough to, to say there are differences because both can lead to these sequelae. And um, I think it's more like the amount of inflammation you have for a long time triggers this. And um, the rationale for therapy here is to block it as much as possible to prevent these long-term uh, consequences of inflammation. But I don't think there's, it's understood whether these different types of mutations give rise to different um, amyloidosis. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions, Dr. Mavahedi? And also uh, about other uh, treatments such as TNF inhibitors. Um, is there any experience with using these uh, drugs uh, for NLRP3 mutations? Um, they have been tested in the beginning. I think they're not very effective. Um, so I think for CUPS, you really have to go for the anti, um, anti l one therapies to prevent mostly the priming of the cells and this vicious cycle that occurs. And that's, how, that's I think, we, how we understand how they work. Um, first of all, you block the release of, of the cytokine um, and the cytokine itself. But TNF is not effective, at least in most Thank of the you. patients. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Lats, I have another question about the diet. I think that was a very important part of your speech. Uh, if we change our diet, uh, can, the, um, can it be changed the pathway of our innate immunity or training protocols of them? Changing Certainly. the diet can be effective? Yeah, I'm, I'm, from our studies, I, and we do many, many more of these types of studies, also taking a beneficial diet and, and you know, there's, there's different types of diets you can, you can do. And we see that the immune cells respond to it. So obviously um, there, there are aspects of any type of diet that can train our immune system. And the training can be to provide higher responses, but it could also be to subdue the immune response, right? So depending on the diet you have, uh, there may be a lot of beneficial factors that are anti-inflammatory that reprogram uh, the cells in the opposite direction. So um, this could be, could have translational relevance because you could imagine that if you prepare for a large operation, for example, and you know that you have a high response to you know, immune stimulants, you could potentially train your diet with a diet, you can train your immune system downwards. So you have a less of a response to, for example, a surgical trauma. But this needs to be done, you know, validated in clinical trials, which we are we're okay. doing at the moment. Thank you very much. Dr. John S. Gary, please ask your question. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Dr. Lutz. Uh, that was great presentation. Thanks for that. And my question is, again, relating to the diet. When we are talking about Western diet, what about the Mediterranean diet? What's your view in that regard? Yeah, that's what I meant. So I think um, a Western diet, at least in the mouse house, is kind of a diet full of sugar, cholesterol, and salt, right? So these are the, the three ingredients that are very high in those diets. And I'm not sure how physiological this is. Um, I, I can tell you from my, my own experience, my own experimentation that we've done um, that if you, for example, switch from a regular standard, you know, 
uh, Western type dye that you have in, 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 in the middle of Europe to, for example, two weeks of completely vegan diet, you have a completely different response of your immune cells. So it, it affects it. And Mediterranean diet, we know it's linked to less disease development in large populations. So, and um, there are lots of ingredients in those types of diets that have beneficial effects in vitro on cell culture. Um, so I could imagine that an exposure of beneficial ingredients to our immune system must have an effect as well if we, if we would study this type of diet in either the mouse house or in a human population. And these are the types of studies we are initiating um, in uh, human populations actually to, to identify how variations of the diet can um, you know, change the immune responses. And the other question is maybe you're talking about the lifestyle effect. Why is specifically we are isolating the diet from lifestyle? Shouldn't life, uh, the diet be included in the lifestyle? Um, I don't really understand the question. So whether a diet is included in lifestyle? Because when we are talking about the effect of lifestyle, obviously the diet is part of the lifestyle. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Western lifestyle is a combination of things that, absolutely. you know, yeah, the diet is, is part of it. Yeah. But it's not all as easy as is in the mouse house where you can take the same okay. genetic mice and the same purchased diet. So it's much more complex than that, right? Thanks for that. Thank you very much. I think uh, we don't have any more questions. I would like to thank you for your very interesting speech. Thank you uh, from our participants and also the international efforts of Tehran University of Medical Sciences, especially uh, Dr. Uh, Ziai. And also thank you from Dr. Uh, Asna Shari. If uh, there is something else, please, uh, uh, give us some points. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lex, I'm really thankful for your fabulous speech. It was really interesting and very informative. And we are honored to have had the experience of this session with you. If there is anything you would like to add, we will be honored to hear. Well, I, I, I think it's a great uh, lecture series you have put together. And um, I think the Zoom format allows us now to connect even without uh, restrictions um, for political reasons or flying or corona reasons. So I think it's a good format that you guys uh, selected here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, once again, I'm really thankful. And um, I hope we can have future collaborations and we can see you in, um, in a very soon future. <laughs> And okay. I would also, thank you, thank you very much. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Nuri Zadeh for being the great moderator of this fantastic session. And uh, also I'm uh, grateful for participation of all of you academics in this session of how I treat autoinflammatory disorders course. I hope you have had an enjoyable time and we will share the post test later with the participants and then we can uh, send the certificates after uh, the, um, all the presentations and after the whole course. As I mentioned before, the certificates are approved and validated by OFLAR, Asia Pacific League of Associations for Rheumatology, Pediatric Rheumatology Society of Iran, Iranian Rheumatology Association, and Tehran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, we invite you to our next session, which is going to be held in two weeks, February 18th, entitled as a role of type one interferons as trigger of cytokine storm. And our speaker is uh, dear Dr. Christoph Kessel from Germany. You can find the details on the next session in our website and you can see the link here. Um, we will write it in the chat for room. Also, we will be very grateful if you can fill in the feedback form that we shared in the chat for room. And thank you very much and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lutz. Such an honor.